First Epistle of Peter, chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers, to the sojourners of the dispersion, that means. Scattered throughout Pontus, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The Jews were dispersed from their land. But the gospel had come to many of them. And this letter is addressed to those believers among the Jews of the dispersion. Many of them, of course, had been present on the day of Pentecost and had heard Peter preach and had doubtless believed on the Lord Jesus on that day and received the Holy Spirit when he preached. And here he is writing to those believers among the Jews of the dispersion. His name, I haven't checked out, but maybe the places mentioned here, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, they might be the same places mentioned in the day of Pentecost. You know, it tells you where the Jews came from on that day. I haven't checked out on that, you might. But any, it's obvious that those are the people to whom he's writing. And this is what he says to them. He describes them elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope. King James says a lively hope. Obviously it's meant to be living, that's modern English, but I rather like the lively hope. <laughs> it makes you lively, does this hope. By the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, that's changed everything for us, to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time their salvation is not going to be finally complete until it is revealed in the last time here you've got that aspect just a word on verse 5 now I used to read it this way you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. That's not right as I see it now. Don't want to be dogmatic. It is kept by the power of God through faith. How are you kept by the power of God? Through faith. God's power on your, his side, your faith on the other. And this is a parallel sentence to that in Ephesians 2. Saved by the great grace of God through faith here kept by the power of God through faith kept unto what? this is where it comes unto that ultimate salvation we're not going to miss it we're going to be kept now here's a little bit that ties in with the old discussion point between oh, we won't give any party next but we'll simply say, between the thought of, can you fall away, can you be saved and perhaps fall away and be lost? Or is it once saved, always saved? Now, you can settle it on a pure technical basis. The Bible says this, and this it implies, once saved, always saved. But here, to me, is that which resolves the problem kept by the power of God through faith. You're not going to fall away. I'm not suggesting that if you did feeble and slip back, you would lose your salvation. But the better thing is to see, I'm not going to. I'm going to be kept. How? Not by my efforts. By the power of God, as in my weakness, I trust. Ah, uh, the lovely chorus a friend of mine wrote, he's in heaven, oh, the love of God. Oh, the love of God. Oh, the love of God for sinful ones like me. Oh, the grace of God. Oh, the grace of God. Oh, the grace of God. 
the guilty ones like me and then oh the power of God oh the power of God oh the power of God to trembling ones like me if you're trembling then you qualify brother this salvation is custom made for sinful ones guilty ones trembling ones and you're going to be kept by the power of God as a, you take your place as a trembling one do you look to Jesus he's not going to suffer you to apostatize and you're going to be kept unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time wherein he greatly rejoiced yes like we did this morning that ultimate salvation though now for a season if need be Ye are in heaviness through manifold trials. We were thinking about that yesterday evening. Temptation sometimes means solicitation to evil. But the same word translated temptation in that sense is in many other places translated trials. Yes. In fact, I think more often that's what you've got to read into that word temptation. There's no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. Does that mean solicitation to evil? Well, it could. But I think it probably means that there's no trial, no test taken, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tested above what you are able, but will provide a way of escape. That the trial of your faith, the testing of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. We've got to have our faces turned to that with a light of glory on them. Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with spirit, Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Those are big words. Those are big words. And those object to will when the saints begin to let the glory out. This is what it says. You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And as we contemplate the greatness of our salvation and the glory that should be revealed in us, we will indeed rejoice. There are heights of rejoicing in him that perhaps we none of us have really known but they're there the possibilities for us God gives us seasons like that but it isn't merely emotional it's rejoicing it's rational it's because of facts which faith contemplates I don't know that I have a joy that's unaccountable just because I believed on Jesus it's as I rationally lay hold of what's declared to me. I say, well, bless my soul. I'm not a pauper. I'm a millionaire spiritually. I've got it in the bag. And, that, and for a man who thought his financial situation was far worse than his balance sheet ultimately revealed, his joy is rational. And so is the joy of our saints. Solid foundation for joy in God by whom we have received the reconciliation. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Once again, he's talking about this ultimate completion. And it means anticipating, receiving by faith, anticipating the end of our, uh, our soul, the, the, the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls. Now then, here end it. As we say in the Anglican Church, here ended the first lesson. Oh, you don't know that, but that's how you know. We'll have two lessons. And it's a good old Elizabethan English. Here begins the first lesson. And then at the end they say, here ended the first lesson. And then later, here begins the first lesson. The second lesson, here ended. Well, now here ended the lesson uh, for the day. Amen. Well, it's good. Just a week to enjoy it. And to do so, I can't read my Bible quickly. 
people say they read it, the uh, whole Bible in a year. I can't. I want to stay on it. The trouble is, it is difficult, I know. But you find, whereas you've been in one part of the Bible, and have been for quite a time, the whole lot, you haven't been in lately, and sometimes you find it's five years since you've gone through Genesis. Well, keep at it, keep rotating. Make a tick, make some, keep some track when you were last in the, in the book. When you know where we're going to go now? Well, just check up. What have you been least in lately? Do that. And may I say about reading our Bible, I don't know what your method is or non-method. Don't, here and there, with your Bible, read it through. As simple as that. Not necessarily are you going to read the, the next book that follows, but get a book and read it through. There's no substitute from reading a book of the Bible through. Begin where you left off yesterday and get excited. Find the thread and pick on it because there's a thread, a connecting thread through every scripture. And as I say, you may want to go through every book as it stands. But then of course it'll be a long time before you get to the New Testament and vice versa. So when you've gone through one book, say, now Lord, which is the next one? Wherever it may be. And I find another thing about reading my Bible. That part of the Bible, that book of the Bible, in which I am, always seems to be the best book of the whole Bible. <laughs> no book like this book. Until I get to the next one. Oh, I said, this is it. Well, surely that's how it should be. It's a wonderful privilege and treasure, which is ours, to be God's dear people, whom he's redeemed out of the land of Egypt by mighty power and who've been given this precious, precious book and the many other privileges which are ours. All right, now, what I want to share with you is from that beautiful passage. By the way, it's very interesting to read the various writers of the New Testament from a rather human standpoint as well as from a very spiritual one. Now, you, you have preachers many here how different they all are, not only in their accent, but their approach, in that part they emphasize, that which is their favorite theme, you can tell. And by the way, you can usually find what the preacher's weak point is in his life, is that point he's always preaching on. So if you have a preacher, he's always on one line, you know, <laughs> that's his weak point. You'll soon find what are my weak points, because I preach on that which I most need, and that's very natural all of us, but didn't I? And so it is. I've been amazed. I've been, you know, I, I, I love old Paul. He's a dear pal of mine. And then I get into Peter. There's another speaker on the platform. He's different. It's the same message, the same Jesus. I'm amazed how same their message is, and yet I'm also impressed with the beautiful diversity of approaches to the same Jesus. John again. It's just like one of these conferences, different preachers. And beware lest you have a favorite one. I've, we're in the, the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, and he had something to say. He said, some of you I'm a, say, I'm a Paul, and I'm a Paulus, and I'm a Cephas. It's their favorite preachers, and they had their particular following, which divided the body of Christ. And the worst party of all were those that say, I'm of Christ as if he, he, he was one of any other, along with us. So whereas we rejoice in the wide diversity of ministry in the body of Christ, beware lest you become the devotee of one more than another, which could bring something of division in the body of Christ. Well now, this is Peter and not Paul. I want to read to you verse 2. Elect these are the believers among the dispersion, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ. The very beginning of our salvation was in the foreknowledge of God. As a gospel song says, long before you were born. No, long before time began, you were part 
of this man. He knew you beforehand. He loved you beforehand. He made plans, not only for your response to his gospel, but to that place of service in his body. Elect according to the form knowledge of God. How I love him for it. Through sanctification, that is the setting apart of the Spirit. And that's what, how it all was made real. The Holy Spirit began to work in my life. When I was far from him, I found myself being convicted and being pursued and worked upon by the dear Holy Spirit. And what was the Holy Spirit bringing me unto? Now this isn't the whole complete story, but this is what put, picked that bit of it that Peter picks up. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, through sanctification, the setting apart of the Holy Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. This is what he was working towards in our lives. And this is what I want to emphasize to you. Just that phrase. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now the beauty about the King James Version is it gives it to you word for word as it is in the Greek. Other versions try and sort of explain what it means. That's what they really are doing. It's a little bit, a little more than literal translation. But the beauty of the King James is word for word. I like it that way. I know it needs some exposition, but that's what the preacher's for. I don't want a nameless committee of translators to do that for me. Give it me word for word, and I'll seek the meaning and seek to spell it. Here it is, word for word. Unto obedience and strengthening of the blood of Jesus. Now here's my little gloss on that. What does that mean? That construction of that phrase. And I want to suggest to you it simply means unto obedient sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Unto obedient sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. We're really talking, coming to a subject that I've had problems with. This question of obedience. And sometimes a message is brought to us where it greatly stresses the need for obedience in the believer's life. And the victory comes through obedience. And obedience is stressed sometimes very much. I'm not denying it's right and proper. I wouldn't query that brother's message. But I have some problems with it. Because it seems a little bit as if I'm going to get back under law. Everything, therefore, depends on my obedience. But that was what I found my problem before. I couldn't obey the law. And that which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Now, there are two sorts of obedience. Legal obedience, which we cannot fulfill, and which only makes us inherit the curse of the law we fail to obey, and evangelical obedience, which is something somewhat different. And I want to suggest to you that what Peter is talking about here is evangelical obedience. Unto obedience, sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. You get evangelical obedience spoken of, that God hath commanded all men everywhere to repent. And he wants you to obey. It's a command that you should repent, that grace might reach you. And those who will not repent are said in Paul's letters to be the, to be the children of disobedience. Does that mean necessarily they're not obeying mum and dad? They're not obeying the law of the land? No, they're not obeying this great call for men to repent. 
They do lots of other things. They may be quite law-abiding c- citizens, but their children of disobedience is only because they won't obey God and repent. And then the call of the gospel is not only to, to, to repent, but to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is a call that you've got to respond to in obedience. Paul has the phrase about those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this phrase, obeying the gospel, is scattered through Paul's writing. And the man who will not obey the gospel, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus, he is a child of disobedience. He's one of those that know not the Lord and obey not the gospel who are going to be banished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. It's interesting that angle, isn't it? A command to obey the gospel. Now this obeying the gospel is not something that we have to do only when we are initially saved. It's something that we're called to do all the way along. Now here, obedient sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now it's quite evident that that is a clear allusion to the Passover. When Israel were commanded each house to take a lamb, when the son, presumably it was a son, had to kill the lamb. He didn't want to. He kept it for several days, he became the household pet. And the father said to the son, either that lamb dies or you die. Son, do what I'm telling you, a baby, kill it. And more than that son, you and I have got to collect the blood in a basin. And God has commanded us, if we want to be spared tonight, that we sprinkle the blood on the doorposts of the houses wherein we are. And he's promised that when he sees the blood, he will pass over us. By the way, the pass over, that doesn't mean, as you might think, he will omit our houses. It's a much bigger word, he will stand over our house. Spread his wing over it and not suffer the destroyer to come in when he sees the blood not when he sees your washing clean washing hung up outside that won't be better it's got to be the blood if you want to have your son spared you've got to obey what Moses said and sprinkle the blood and those houses that obediently sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the doorpost where well, now that is the great call of the gospel. Obey the gospel. And obey yourself of that blood. You see, there are two stages. That's not good enough, it's got to be blood on the door. We have blood revealed in Scripture. But it's applying the blood that really matters. On the doorpost of my guilty heart. The great hymn we sing in England, Glory be to Jesus who in bitter pain poured for me his life's blood from those sacred veins. Grace and life eternal in that blood I see. Blessed be his compassion, infinitely kind. Abel's blood for vengeance pleaded to the skies, but the blood of Jesus for my pardon cries from this world, oft as it is spring. On our guilty heart, Satan in confusion now this obedient sprinkling of the blood of Jesus is not however only for our initial salvation it is this is the way anybody any doubts have you obeyed the gospel have you obediently appropriated the blood of Jesus that he was shed for sinners therefore for me I repented and claimed it and sprinkled it by faith but this is something This obedience, which is applicable to the believer again and again. Listen, obedience brings it of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I believe 
the major part of evangelical obedience is to obey God and sprinkle the blood again on that which requires not that your eternal salvation is at stake but your fellowship with God is and very often the things have happened in our lives that need to die. And you won't have all the sweetness of his fellowship unless he sees the blood of his dear son, newly, freshly sprinkled on the doorpost of your heart with regard to that thing. And notice, it's not only on the lintel between us and God, but on the two side posts between us and others. Now you may imagine that all is well between you and God, but how is it between you and your wife, your husband, your workmate, that fellow Christian? And the blood has to be sprinkled obediently, not only on that which relates obviously to my relationship with God, but on that which relates to my fellowship with others. Actually, they're not two relationships. They go together. As the spokes of a wheel, get nearer the hub, they get nearer to one another. If at some given point on a spoke, it is not near the next spoke, you know to that extent it's not near the hub. And so it is only one relationship, top and side. Obedient sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now this, to me, gives me the clue to this question of obedience which very often gets stressed I'm sure under the guidance of the Spirit doubtless in these conferences you've often had a brilliant and yet perhaps you've had that same little problem in your thinking and perhaps you haven't seen perhaps it's another sort of obedience than that old legal one now this verse gives me the clue obedience in the life of a Christian now, when a moral injunction comes to me with personal application from the scriptures or through someone who's preaching, and under the gospel, the moral, moral injunctions abide. The Ten Commandments as a revelation of God's will for me is there still, the Sermon on the Mount. Every epistle of Paul is full of them especially the last chapters. You know, you, you, you get quite enthusiastic about the early chapters about the wonderful doctrines and you cool off when it comes to those last ones. But my dear friends, that's what he's getting to. That's what he wants. That's why he's writing. Not just a little extra bit at the end. Whenever a moral injunction, let him that steals, steal him off. Each esteeming other better than himself. By love, serve one another. It is because I'm not keeping it. I'm not doing it. Or I'm about not to do it. I'm about to infringe it. And inasmuch as it's been in my heart, God looks at the thought of the heart as the deed. Therefore, but the first element in my, my obedience to the moral injunction of the word is to repent. Is a person not quite honest or about not to be honest? He's planning to uh, make a false statement. It's him that steals, stole, steal no more. That's steal if only from the inland revenue. You say, oh Lord, I promise not to do it. No, no. It was in your heart to do it. It was a fact as far as God you must first to Does that help you? When the word comes, it invariably catches me, breaks me, or about to, in my thoughts which is the same thing. And I cannot say, all right, Lord, 
I'll do this or I won't do the other in obedience to you. No, no. You've got to repent first because in, it's already been done. In intention, if not in deed. And very often in deed. What about this command? Love one another. And that comes to you when you've been resenting someone. Do you now say, now Lord, I'm going to love that person. But you have been resenting. You've said some bad things about him. And the first, the first step is for you to repent. I can't see how we can walk with Jesus without being repenting Christians. If we walk in the light. And the light shows what's wrong. If a room is dark and the electric light is not on, you bump into a piece of furniture and think it's the table, it's the chair. And when the light is on, the chair is the chair, the light and the table is the table. And walking in the light as God's in the light means I'm willing to be exposed. I'm willing for God to show me up as I am all the time. And I say yes to what that light reveals. Then I have fellowship, not only with God but with other people. A new honesty possesses my soul. And whereas there's no rule that you've got to cough up, cough up to another person every time, all the things that go on between you, there is a willingness to be open about yourself. And he may well lead you, give testimony, share, in a very honest, sweet, lovely way. But the fellowship is with, with God as well. I tell you, God can do anything with a man who's honest. His sins are no problem to God if he's honest about them. He's walking in the light, saying, yes, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. And then, the blood of Jesus Christ, God son, cleanses us from all sin, the shame, the stain. You're through on the shame of it because the blood has cleansed you from it. You've accepted yourself as a sinner and you're able then to give a sinner's testimony the trouble is that the testimonies we give are not always sinners' testimonies as they should be. I, I don't want to make this legal that every testimony must of necessity be a sinner's testimony in it, that it speaks of repentance and cleansing. Maybe just a glad heart thanking God for undeserved goodness in your affairs. But some of us only have that sort of testimony or only give it we don't often give a testimony that shows us up in a bad light. But what shows us up in a bad light always shows Jesus up in a good light. He, he can only increase at my expense as I decrease. And so this to me is the heart of evangelical obedience. I begin at that point. It may not always be so. But I don't know these sort of seeing what God's commands I make sort of promises ahead of time what I'm going to do tomorrow. Just good intention. I walk with Jesus in the light. And that light catches me up. And my obedience is to go obedient in this matter of repentance. Not only obedient but zealous. Revelation 3, you know the great bit about the Laodicean church, it says, be zealous therefore and repent. We might be zealous in soul winning and zealous in the work of the church. God says, above all, you be zealous in the matter of repentance. And it's beautiful when God works it in us. <laughs> he has to work it in. He's going to get it out of me. I often tell the Lord, if you want this and that out of me, you've got to put it in first because it ain't there naturally. But that's living under grace. This is part of the new covenant. He writes his law in our hearts. He put into us what he wants out of us. But I want to go further. All right? The first element in obedience is to repent to that thing he shows when I'm not obeying. But I don't know that that's quite enough. Where's your boldness and confidence going to come? If having repented, you see what a poor sort of Christian you are. A Christian as poor as I am can't expect much blessing from God, can't expect to be used. That's where the blood of Jesus comes in. It isn't. 
obedience only in repentance, but above all, above all, obedience in sprinkling the blood of Jesus Christ. Obedience sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Take God's side. Call it what it is, yes, but go no You must appropriate that the blood of Jesus is for that which you've called sin. And remember, it's only for sin. Only for sin. And sin is our big problem, right up to the gates of heaven. Being fallen sons of Adam, though regenerate. And I've got to sprinkle a beaded strength of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because when he sees the blood, obediently sprinkled anew on that which he showed no matter how shameful you couldn't have a better righteousness with God if you were the archangel Gabriel It's the blood of Jesus. It's taken account of sin in the most awesome way. In his love for me, he was willing to do it in his body on the street. But he wants me to apply it and get the benefit of it and the joy of it. And when I've sprinkled the blood, what does that old hymn say? Soft as it is sprinkled on our guilty heart. Satan in confusion, terror struck, departs because he cannot go on accusing me and making me feel depressed. We overcome him, not sin. We overcome the one who takes advantage of our sin in accusing us by the blood of the Lamb. And so people who may have to be repenting can be so wonderfully bold, so confident. In fact, when you take the place of a sinner, your position is better with God than when it was before. Before you were standing on the ground of innocence. You hadn't done it, no, it wasn't. It was only a temptation these fine distinctions we try and make. So you want to stand before God? I'm afraid you won't get very much from God on the grounds of your innocence. But if you can see some place where you can locate yourself as a sinner, you're on the ground of grace. And there's nothing that God will do for a penitent on the ground of grace. You'll be treated in a way way beyond your deserving. Marvelous of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount out poured, there were the blood of the Lamb. I believe that's a wonderful thing. Do you know we haven't got it in our English book? I've tried to introduce it in meetings. We put it on sheets. But no one's put it in a book yet. When I first came to the States, a friend of mine, an Englishman who'd come to live over here, and he'd been round preaching. He took me round in his car. He says, Roy, he was the singer, beautiful tenor voice. He said, John Whittle of the West. John Whittle said to me, I'm going to get the people to sing a hymn you've never heard before. And it's going to sweep you off your feet, if I'm not mistaken. And it is with It's grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. You've got to ask yourself sometimes, which is greater? Your sin of God's grace? Because the way in which you go around taking a stick to yourself would give us to believe that you think your sin is bigger than God's grace. Oh, beautiful. In God's vocabulary, the opposite to sin is not good. The opposite to sin is grace. With sin abounds, grace is much more abounds. And therefore, this is error in for us to take the sinner's grace and obediently sprinkle the blood of Jesus. And is the blood sprinkled on the doorpost? Seems all okay between you and the Lord? What about this and that that happened? 
And is it sprinkled on the two side pits? Is there something that yet needs to be settled between you and another, the way you spoke? Answered that. A bead sprinkle the blood of Jesus there if you want fellowship again with God. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, 13, is it? Uh, makes further reference to the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 12, 24. We come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, listen, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. What do you think that phrase means? The blood of sprinkling. I would suggest it means the blood for sprinkling. It's for sprinkling. It's yours to make use of. The blood of the sprinkling. And you need to use that little hyssop weed which they used on the Passover night and they pulled it out of the wall and made that weed into a brush. The picture of sin. Again and again. The blood off as it is sprinkled. Off. Off. Off as it is sprinkled. On our dear heart. This is God's grace. And I would suggest then, here you have it, unto, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, through sanctification of spirit, unto, obedient sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. Are you arguing with God? You can, because it isn't easy to take the place of the wrong one. It's the other person who's wrong. But God says your attitudes have not been right. Your reactions have not been right. They might have been wrong, but you haven't been right. And nothing is gained by confessing the other person's sins. It's mine. Unto a beast and spirit. I've got to be that. And if, if the other person doesn't get right, you're right. Sometimes there's an argy-bargy going on, a group. Everybody's blaming everybody else. And one man after a member says, his brethren, I take the place of the wrong one, I've been wrong. They're glad to hear you <laughs> He's the only man who's right now. Because when you say you're wrong, God says you're right by the blood. When you say you're right, you're wrong. He's the only man who's crazy. He's God. He's, he's in fellowship with God. He's lost his reputation, granted, but he's gained his peace. <laughs> Amen. Unto a bead of sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. And then, you positively move out in the direction of the thing commanded. But you do so under grace. Somehow this transactions that are taking place between you and Jesus at the cross, something happens. And as you've deeply repented of not loving, but rather hating and resenting, and had the blood sprinkled upon it and gained peace with God, God delights to put in you what you confess of. And you find yourself loving. You find yourself acting. And it's evangelical abuse. After they consider with living, not under the law, but under the faith. Under obedience, strengthening of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you bring to Jesus for the cleansing of are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless of the white linen fire? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Come on now. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments what this are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the land?